Welcome to the Gilbert House Fellowship, a virtual gathering of believers seeking to better understand the Word of God with your hosts, Derek and Sharon Gilbert and Sam T. Doxon. From the beautiful Missouri Ozarks, greetings and welcome to the Gilbert House Fellowship Old Testament Bible Study for Sunday, June 7th, 2020. I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert. We're so, so very happy that you've chosen to join us this morning. And for those of you who are, you know, accustomed to getting to go to your local congregation of some kind and you miss it. Because not every church has opened up that again. That is true. They should be. Don't yeah. Gone it. They ought to be. But uh, if your church is not open up, we're glad that you decided that you can uh, worship in a virtual way with mm-hmm. our congregation. Just a reminder that all of our archives going back to 2015, which covers one full trip through the Bible, we're now on our second lap, as it were, <laughs> uh, are available at the website gilberthouse.org, where you'll also find the downloads for our free mobile app which is good for iOS and Android phones and tablets. So download the free app and you'll have access to these studies as soon as they're published, which is generally by midday every Sunday. Mm -hmm. So if you decide that you want to spend a few weeks going crazy, you just want to binge (laughs) on Gilbert House Fellowship, they are there for you. That's right. They're for the taking. Well, it, we, and we go through in a chronological order, which means in the order in which the stories took place. So uh, that's why we got through the first 10 chapters of Genesis, skipped to Job, and then back to Genesis now, mm-hmm. which is where we are. Things will get interesting once we get into the time of uh, uh, Samuel, Saul, and David as we start skipping back and forth between uh, Samuel, Kings, Chronicles, and uh, the Psalms. Yes, so, yes. So, yeah, it, it gets really interesting. I love it when we do yeah. David's, you know, adventures, if you want to call them that, mm-hmm. and then the Psalms that he wrote at the time that it was taking place. Yeah. It really makes those come to life. It really does. Also, really quickly, <coughs> excuse me, I want to uh, mention that as Derek reads through these lists of names, some of these will sound familiar to you because they are names from the book of Job. Right, right. That is a, uh, and some are, are names that we'll find in other Parts in other regions, of the yes. Old Testament, yes. yeah. So a lot of interesting names that uh, show up here. So don't think that just because the names sound familiar to some and are familiar and are the same as some in the Book of Job, does not mean that Job lived after Abraham. No, what it means is that the names that we're reading are names that were popular in this period of time. Yeah, just as. One of the aspects of Egyptian history that I find absolutely fascinating, the second intermediate period when the uh, the Amorites moved down from Canaan and dominated northern Egypt. And there were kings who were ruling in Egypt who now are described as pharaohs. They really weren't called pharaohs back in the day, but uh, they have Semitic names. Yeah. And one of them was actually named Jacob. Yeah, isn't that amazing? So, yeah, but not the Jacob of the Bible. No, exactly. Right. I mean, so. if you're my, my name's Sharon, it's, it's sort of an old fashioned name, but people in my age bracket, there are lots of us. Mm-hmm. It was a very popular name at one time. And of course it's a biblical name, but uh, just because one Sharon does something doesn't mean that all the Sharons were involved in it. That's correct. Don't associate me with some other Sharon. <laughs> Unless of course she's done really great things. Yeah. In which case, Oh, yeah, totally did that. Sharonal appropriation. <laughs> so uh, today we're going to dive back in and uh, we'll get into some uh, history of some of the neighbors of Israel and then back to the uh, story of uh, Jacob and his line. Uh, but we'll open with a word of prayer. Mm-hmm. Father, we thank you for bringing us together through this um, this study and through your word. Uh, Lord, we pray for wisdom and discernment, not just as we, we study your word, but as we see what's happening in the world around us. These are turbulent times here not just in the United States, but around the world as this unrest has spread to other parts of the world, some places where it was going on already, but now it has taken on a new form and a new, a new name, a new cause ostensibly. Father, we just pray for the wisdom and the discernment to recognize that the human faces, the human actors involved in this, this chaos are simply reflecting the will of their masters and that it is not, as Paul wrote, it, it is not the human opponents we wrestle, but the principalities and powers behind them. So, Lord, help us to be loving enough to pray for those who are condemning the rest of us, condemning those of us who follow you, condemning those of us who will not bow the knee to other men and to the principalities and powers they serve, because in truth, that is what they want. 
the knee not bowed to humans or in service of a human, uh, or the memorial of a human, but in, in truth, symbolizing the worship of another God. Lord, they know not what they do. Help us to view them in that respect, to pray for them and to show them love when the opportunities present. It's difficult, Father, but through you, all things are possible. And we pray for that strength and that wisdom in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. You know, I'm glad you brought that up, but because isn't it interesting that that seems to be the the symbol of alliance with this large group, what appears to be a mm-hmm. large group. Honestly, I think it's a very tiny fraction. Sure. They just get a lot of media attention, exactly. makes they it do. seem larger than they are. Makes right. it seem larger. But this group that are, they're, they're frankly, they're being used by the spirits. Mm-hmm. But that's free will. Yes. That's free will. But this symbol of taking a knee, this symbol that somehow that means you are standing up to the man. Mm-hmm. No, no, you're bowing down to the spirits behind all of this. Yes, that's that's really what it means. And, and let's be clear that there are genuine grievances that need to be addressed. Oh, I so agree. But There's no question that that is the case. But these spirits are so devious and so insidious that they will hijack a, 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 a movement to address a legitimate grievance and to try to right a wrong mm-hmm. and divert it into another Direction, And that's yes. exactly what's happened. It's so interesting. And we'll get to uh, Genesis 36 here in a minute. But it's so interesting that it comes at the same time that churches are closed. Yes. And so we have this anti-church uh, sentiment that yeah. is driving a rebellion, mm-hmm. as Maxine Waters calls it. An insurrection. Not, she calls it yeah. an insurrection. Excuse me, an insurrection is an illegal act against right, the government. Right, Insurrection Act of 1807 gives the federal government the authority to put it down with the military. Yes, she does not want she that. She doesn't want that, or maybe she does. We, uh, yeah. Maybe yeah. she we'll does. provoke and something and then it will, yeah. Yeah, but that's the, I'm sorry, you're putting vulnerable individuals, whether they see themselves as that or not, right. they're vulnerable right. individuals into harm's way, and yeah. the spirits don't care. No, they don't. That's really what they want. And- Sadly, the the calls, and we saw this uh, yesterday where the mayor of Minneapolis put himself in a bad situation. And, and frankly, I don't know anything about Jacob Fry. Um, I just, all I know is what I see on, uh, and I try not to let my prejudices, and I, and I use that term not in a racial sense, but just um, biases mm-hmm. about, uh, the, you know, the fact that he's uh, a, a Democratic politician, mm-hmm. you know, influence my, my judgment of him because I, I don't know the man. I don't know anything about him, his history or backstory, He's just a whatever. Human being. But uh, I, I'm sorry, he, he has come across in the media like a, a, frater- a, a, a an older fraternity guy who got himself in over his head and he's in a situation that he can't control. He appeared at a rally yesterday to show solidarity with the protesters in Minneapolis. But then they turned and said, you know, demanded that he, he commit to defunding the police well, as a mayor of a, a city, you can't do that. No, you can't do that. For a and couple it would of reasons. Be a first, foolish thing to do. Well, right. I mean, first, first of all, that that's the the point. It would be foolish even if he could do it. But the mm-hmm. point is, legally, he can't do it. No, he can't. <laughs> the mayor doesn't have that kind of power in an no, American city. No, they don't. And you would think that the college kids, who are many of the the people involved, have educations. Yeah. And you would think that they would know that. Yeah, but it, it was an opportunity to create a moment for social media. And a, 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 a video clip, mm-hmm. a video bite, sound bite for the media. And so Mayor yes. Fry got himself caught in, in uh, hoisted by his own petard. And he was, just remember, yes, and just remember, this is not new. No, this no. This sort of rebellious act, this moving a, a large group of people by convincing them that they are in the right and everyone else is in a group called others, mm-hmm. that others must be... Uh, forced to change, to go along with right. the sentiment of this smaller group. That has been going on for millennia Yeah, because of human sin. Exactly. And, and of course, as we talk about sin, we need to remember the words of the Apostle John, who wrote that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Exactly. And the truth is not in us. So exactly. we have to recognize, look, we've got specks in our own eyes. Some of us have logs in our own eyes. Mm-hmm. We'll, we'll address those first. But that, that's got to apply on all sides. And until both sides are willing to say, we need to find common ground 
and set aside differences and try to find common ground to work together, nothing will be accomplished. And that's what the principalities and powers and cosmic rulers over this present mm-hmm. darkness are trying to foment, which is why we see this unrest continuing to build. They want to keep one side or the other or both sides, preferably believing that the other side is completely wrong, evil, mm-hmm. and must be sta- not just changed, but stamped out. And as long as they keep that going, they keep, d- divide and conquer. Okay. But it's, yes. it's coming from the spirit realm. Really quickly, you and I have discovered a very, very funny show. Oh, yes. Called Gallivant. It, there are only two seasons, only 18 shows, but it is a musical mm-hmm. comedy. And by that, I mean it's a parody of musicals. Yes. And the music is written by actual guys who win awards for writing Disney musicals. Right. The guys behind the music for animated features like Beauty and the Beast and The Little Mermaid exactly. and Aladdin. So this music so, is wonderful. Set yeah. in the 12th century, you've got this magnificent guy named Gallivant, who is the, the <laughs> Galahad character. But... One of the episodes was called Giants versus Dwarves. Right, right. And it had a group of giants <laughs> who hated these dwarves because they decided they were going to build a bridge together and the giants built theirs too high and the dwarves built theirs too low. Mm-hmm. So they they decide it and the musical number is a takeoff on the jets and the, the sharks uh, the sharks from mm-hmm. uh from West Side, West Side Story. Story. Right. And it's hilarious because when they all get together the Third party observer to this action, this war, is this woman who says, sings a song that don't they realize they're all five feet ten? Yeah, yeah, they're all the same height. They're all the exact same height. So when they start fighting one another, they sort of lose track of who's a giant and who's a dwarf. Wait, stop. Okay, all you giants, raise hands. Okay, this isn't working. How about uh, we go shirts and skins? (laughs) Wait, stop. (laughs) Why are we even fighting? That's the bottom line. Right. We are being made to fight over some of the silliest things. I'm not saying that the loss of someone's life or being oppressed or being being hunted by what perceived to be hunted by a, a group of individuals mm-hmm. that wear uniforms. I can see where that would make you angry. Right, right. But this sort of action where you go in and you burn down neighborhoods, right. you steal train car loads full of stuff, mm-hmm. those actions are foolish and you've lost sight of what actually caused your grievance in the first place. Right. And when these protests spread far from the communities where the incidents that caused the uh, uprising in the first place, Minneapolis, Louisville, mm-hmm. um, Baltimore, St. Louis, it is, it is gone global. We're seeing protests in places like New Zealand, uh, in Athens. There were protesters throwing Molotov cocktails at the American embassy in Athens. Yes. I mean, the Greeks have other issues to worry about, like the country's bankrupt. The EU's trying to squeeze yeah. them for more. And their next door neighbor, President Erdogan of Turkey, is trying to send more violent Muslims across the border. Exactly. Well, they, here, so anyway, it, it's so irrational. It has to be spiritual. It, uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, here's our prayer for all of you. If you're listening to this in the archives years from now, yeah, mm. I pray that you listen to our conversation about current day events and you go, oh, praise God, that blew over. Mm-hmm. Shortly after that. And we've figured it out since then. That is my prayer. Prophetically speaking, however, that's a long shot. Yes. In fact, um, as we look forward to the the, um, Battle Ready Conference in just a couple of weeks, and we'll be getting our presentations on video here shortly, I'm going to address this from the standpoint of of the prophetic uh, influence of of chaos, Mm -hmm. because I think that's that's partly what's behind and maybe in large part what's behind what's going on. Yeah, I think so too. Well, now we are finally going to get to chapter 36 of the book of Genesis. (laughs) Yes. And trust us when we say that we would prefer not to have to talk about any of this. Well, that's true. But as we look historically in the Bible, we see that Brother was fighting brother, cousin was fighting cousin Mm -hmm. Again, 3,500 years ago. Nothing new. Cain killed Abel. So, Genesis chapter 36. These are the generations of Esau, that is, Edom. Esau took to, and 
this time stamp. This is roughly thirty, roughly sixteen hundred BC. Very good. Uh, Esau took his wives from the Canaanites: Ada, the daughter of Elon the Hittite; Oholibamah, the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zibion the Hivite; and Basimath, Ishmael's daughter, the sister of Nebaioth. Uh, Basimath, incidentally, means. Um, Spice, which is really interesting because Nebaioth, as we mentioned previously, is the progenitor of the Nabataeans, mm-hmm. who were the tribe of uh, Arabs who mm-hmm. uh, established Petra. Controlled the spice. Controlled the spice. So you fast forward 1600 years to the time of Jesus and the apostles, and the Nabataeans controlled what is now Edom, or what was at this time, Edom, Moab, Ammon, all the way up to Damascus, and uh, Petra. And the spice trade along the um, east side of the Red Sea that uh, then went to the port at Gaza, sent spice all across the Mediterranean. They became very wealthy. And you can see Petra with us next April. We'll Mm -hmm. tell you more about that at the end of uh, the study. Um, So anyway, Basimath, spice, Ishmael's daughter, the sister of Nebaioth. And Adab bore to Esau Eliphaz. And that was one of the names we Mm -hmm. read in the book of Job. Basimath bore Reuel, which was the name of the uh, priest of Midian. Jethro. Yes, that's right. I knew I'd come across that before. Right. Yes. yes. Uh, Moses' father in law. And Aholabama bore Yayush, Yalam, and Korah. And Korah, Korah is, is a name. One of, yes. Shows up in a couple hundred years later in the time of Moab. He led the rebellion in Moab. Moses led the rebellion against Moses. Mm-hmm. These are the sons of Esau who were born to him in the land of Canaan. Then Esau took his wives, his sons, his daughters, and all the members of his household, his livestock, all his beasts, and all his property that he had acquired in the land of Canaan. Isaac was mainly um, in the Negev, mostly lived in the Negev, the Mm -hmm. south of Israel, around Beersheba and uh, that area. So um, Esau then took his stuff and moved east across the Arava into uh, what became Edom, the land around Petra. Yes. He went into a land away from his brother Jacob, for their possessions were too great for them to dwell together. The land of their sojournings could not support them because of their livestock. So Esau settled in the hill country of Seir. And Seir is the uh, Shara Mountains, mm-hmm. which are the low mountains along the east side of the Arava. That's the valley between the Dead Sea in the north and the Red Sea on the south. Mm-hmm. And uh, this, um, the uh, Shara Mountains, mm-hmm. the Lord of the Shara Mountains, right, right. Shara, was worshipped in Petra. Right. And you have a theory about that. So we yeah. won't really reveal that, but you will be surprised. Yes, yes. Our Petra book next year. Mm-hmm. Esau is Edom. These are the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites in the hill country of Seir. These are the names of Esau's sons. Eliphaz, the son of Ada, the wife of Esau. Reuel, the son of Basimath, the wife of Esau. The sons of Eliphaz were Timon. Job name. Yep. And um, a, a, a location. In fact, Timon is often used as a uh, synonym for Edom. Mm-hmm. May refer to the... The oasis at uh, Tema, but scholars are kind of divided on that. There's another thought that Timon was located in the vicinity of Basra in uh, Edom. Oh, uh uh-huh. Yeah, Mm -hmm. not to be confused with Basra in southern Iraq. Different Basra. Different Basra. Yeah. Um, So, uh, Eliphaz were Timon, Omar, Zepho, Gatam, and Kenaz. Timnah was a concubine of Eliphaz, Esau's son. She bore Amalek to Eliphaz, and we run into the Amalekites Mm -hmm. when the Israelites get out of Egypt. Um, Also, uh, Timnah was the name of that uh, location, was the name of of the location of those copper mines in the Negev, Mm -hmm. which will be on the tour of uh, Israel. Next April. Next April. Yeah, we'll we'll go see essentially King Solomon's mines. Yes. Uh, I know, isn't that exciting? Um, let's see. These are the sons of Ada, Esau's wife. These are the sons of Reuel, Nahath, Zerah, Shammah, and Mitzah. These are the sons of Basimath, Esau's wife. These are the sons of Holobama, the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zibion, Esau's wife. She bore to Esau, Yeush, Yalam, and Korah. These are the chiefs of the sons of Esau. The sons of Eliphaz, the firstborn of Esau, the chiefs Timon, Omar, Zepho, Kinaz, Korah, Gatam, and Amalek. These are the chiefs of Eliphaz in the land of Edom. These are the sons of Ada. These are the sons of Reuel, Esau's son, the chiefs Nehoth, Zerah, Shammah, and Mitzah. 
These are the chiefs of Reuel in the land of Edom. These are the sons of Basimath, Esau's wife. It's an interesting formula here. Yeah. Clearly written see. from the standpoint of um, uh, and kind of an oral tradition to make it easier for the speaker to remember. That's a really good point because most people did not read. Mm-hmm. These are the sons of, okay, did a whole Obama. Um, or did I? No, I did not. No, These are the sons of Aholabama, Esau's wife, the chiefs Yeush, Yalam, and Korah. These are the chiefs born of Aholabama, the daughter of Anna, Esau's wife. These are the sons of Esau, that is, Edom, and these are their chiefs. These are the sons of Seir the Horite. So Seir the Horite was mm-hmm. the one for whom those mountains were named mm-hmm. and uh, eventually moved out by the Edomites. There was, a, a, because they were connected in... Um, Genesis, they'll be connected in Deuteronomy as well to the Rephaim tribes who were moved out that uh, um, God put the relatives of and descendants of Abraham east of the Jordan River to kind of push those Rephaim tribes mm-hmm. out of there. Um, these are the sons of Seir, the Horite, the inhabitants of the land, Lotan, which is the Canaanite version of Leviathan. Yes. So, yeah, he, <laughs> he named his son Chaos monster. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Although or there are some kids to Ted get... Cooper. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's a Galavandra. Uh, uh, Lotan, Shoval, Zibion, Anna, Deshan, Izer, and Deshan. Well, Deshan. Deshan and Deshan. Yeah. yeah. D I S H O N and D I S H A N. Deshan and Deshan. These are the chiefs of the Horites, the sons of Seir in the land of Edom. The sons of Lotan were Hori and Himam, and Lotan's sister was Timna. And Timna, of course, was, yeah, became what? A, uh, was a concubine of, uh, Yes, a concubine of Eliphaz, the son of Esau. So that's how their lines connected. Uh, these are the sons of Shoval, Alvan, Menahath, Ival, as in Mount Ival? Um, possibly. Yeah, spelled the same way, E-B-A-L. Mm-hmm. Shepho and Onam. These are the sons of Sibion, Aea and Anna. He is the Anna who found the hot springs in the wilderness as he pastured the donkeys of Sibion, his father. Mm. Hmm. These are the children of Anna. Dishon and Aholabama, the daughter of Anna. Hmm. Eval means a stone or bare mountain. Ah, okay. So again, probably just a popular name mm-hmm. because there's a lot of stone and bare mountains, especially when you get over into Jordan. Yeah, we could call ourselves living in Eval County. County. Yes. Uh, these are the sons of... Uh, these are the children of Anna, Dishon, and Aholabama, the daughter of Anna. These are the sons of Dishon, Hemdan, Eshban, Ithran, and Keran. These are the sons of Izer, Bilhan, Zaavan, and Akan. These are the sons of Dishan, Uz, as in the land of, mm-hmm. and Aran. These are the chiefs of the Horites, the chiefs Lotan, Shoval, Zivion, Anna, Dishon, Izer, and Dishan. These are the chiefs of the Horites, chief by chief in the land of Seir. These are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom before any king reigned over the Israelites. And this is a question now that some will ask. If Moses wrote the Torah, which we believe he did, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, Mm -hmm. how then would he have said any king reigned over the Israelites since the first king wasn't until King Saul 400 years later? That's a really good question. Yeah. A couple of possible answers. This could be a uh, a later insertion by a uh, a scribe Mm -hmm. just to clarify things. Or it could be that Moses, writing under the influence of the Holy Spirit, was inspired well that's my take on it because yeah. after all if we believe that every <laughs> punctuation mark even every jot and tittle within the original language mm-hmm. is inspired by the holy spirit then the holy spirit knew it all yeah yep by the way the name bella means destruction uh-huh. who named their child you know chaos monster and another one's tears <laughs> destruction well uh, mr and mrs lugosi <laughs> clearly <laughs> huh? Huh? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, there are some kids, though, uh, some little boys, you'd probably <laughs> think that'd be appropriate. All right, chaos, settle down. Settle down, destruction. Yeah. <laughs> so Heiser should rename his pugs. <laughs> yeah. Lotan and Bela. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. 
Maybe we could get a couple more dachshunds. That's it, yes. Levi- <laughs> That's it, Leviathan and Behemoth. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh, the chaos. Yeah. Wiener dogs. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Back, back to back task. To, uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, verse 30 again of Genesis 36. Uh, verse 29 again. These are the chiefs of the Horites, the chiefs Lotan, Shoval, Zivion, Anna, Deshon, Izer, and Deshan. These are the chiefs of the Horites, chief by chief in the land of Seir. These are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom before any king reigned over the Israelites. Bela, in other words, nah, 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 we had kings first. Yeah. Bela, the son of Beor, reigned in Edom, the name of his city being Dinhaba. Bela died in Jobab, or Yobab, not Jobab, as in Jobab. Yovav. Briggs. Yeah, Yovav, actually. Yovav, the son of Zerah of Basra. And again, that's B-O-Z-R-A-H, not Basra as in Iraq. Uh, Yovav, the son of Zerah of Basra, reigned in his place. Basra means uh, sheep gate, if I remember correctly. Oh, well, that would make sense. Yeah. So that would be a common name, actually. Yeah, yeah. Yovav died, and Husham of the land of the Temanites reigned in his place. And Teman, again, if it's Tema, is, was uh, an oasis that was south and east of there. So uh, it was almost like they had a, a high king ruling over the chiefdoms of uh, mm-hmm. Edom. Uh, so, sort of like the judges in Israel, actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, Husham died, and Hadad, named for the storm god, Hadad, the son of Bidad, who defeated Midian in the country of Moab, reigned in his place, the name of his city being Avith. Hadad died, and we see later that there was an Edomite king named Hadad who uh, fled from Solomon. Mm. Uh, Hadad died, and Samla of Masrikat reigned in his place. Samla died, and Shaul, Saul, basically, Shaul of Rehovoth on the Euphrates reigned in his place. Now, this is an interesting uh, bit of, of history here. Uh, we've mentioned, if you go back through the uh, the archives you'll find one or two mentions of a Canadian historian by the name of Dan Gibson. And Dan's father, I'd forgotten this, um, wrote a book about the origin of Edom. He believes that the Edomites were the Hyksos kings who ruled northern Egypt. I mentioned before the Amorites who moved into northern Canaan. Uh, Dan Gibson's father, and I forget his father's first name, believed that they weren't Amorite, they were Edomite and that this verse here is evidence in the Bible supporting that theory mm. because Shaul, Shaul of Rehovoth on the Euphrates ruled over Edom. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. It's a long way away. Right. And this is a period of history about the time of, uh, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when those uh, Semitic speaking rulers were in charge of northern Egypt and mm-hmm. basically set up their own kingdoms. So, if, and they found references to Hyksos kings on monuments that were found as, way, as far away as Cyprus and in uh, modern Baghdad, which was ancient uh, Akkad. Hmm. The Akkadian Empire was based where Baghdad is now. So, so bottom line is this whole family and the descendants, they were bad dudes. They, they were bad dudes. And the Edomites may have controlled a larger kingdom than the Bible suggests or that scholars have found. The thing is that just didn't leave enough textual evidence for archaeologists to make that case. But there is a theory anyway, with some evidence and this verse here is part of it, that uh, perhaps the Edomites ruled a wider range than we thought. Yes, Mrs. G. Oh, hi, Mr. Gilbert. I have a question. Um, if all of this is true, mm-hmm. then wouldn't it be interesting if there's a God perhaps associated with Dushara, Mm -hmm. that spiritually speaking, whether directly or indirectly, was building his own infernal council, Mm -hmm. let's put it that way, around the Shara Mountains. Yes. And that's why later on, when the Hebrews are leaving Egypt and they travel through that area, the Lord is taking back territory. It's all about a long, about a long spiritual war. Right. Interestingly, when they came out, though, remember God said, "You can't have any of the territory of Edom, Moab, or or, or Ammon because I've given that to them." Yes, yes, but and and he, and he did. He promised to Hagar that he would take care of her descendants. Right. But 
Oh, sorry, sorry, because some of those are Hagarites who live down there. Yeah, Ishmael and his descendants, yes, right? Yes. The Arabic tribes. Exactly. And, and Esau went down there and married Ishmael's daughter, I think. Right, who was... Um, yes, yes. Yes. So we're talking about the Lord keeping a promise, but at the same time, uh, he allowed this spiritual false Eden to arise this mm-hmm. false divine council, this false, this infernal council. Right, right. To um, perpetuate there and to proliferate there. Yeah, and yeah. even to reach out far away and control it. Mm-hmm. Far away to areas that eventually Yahweh would say, no, no, that's mine. Yeah. Canaan, the land of Israel, mm-hmm. which became the land of Israel, God chose for himself and called out, you know, this this belongs to me. Yeah. He even signaled that in the days of Abraham. Yes, when exactly. The the binding of Isaac took place on Mount Moriah, mm-hmm. which um, at least some scholars believe is is was a term that actually meant mountain of the Amorites mm-hmm. that uh, there's a, there's a technical term, uh, aphesis, yes. where you drop the first syllable off of mm-hmm. a word. And that uh, Moriah was actually Amora, mm-hmm. or Amorites. Yeah. That kind of signaled to the spirit realm that uh, God had chosen that place as something special because mm-hmm. that's where the threshing floor of Arana was. Where exactly. David purchased the land and Solomon built the temple there. And the spirits are not omniscient. Mm-hmm. They have to have spies and they can't see very far into the future, if at all. So right. they have to figure out based on what Yahweh is doing. Mm hmm how to respond to that or prepare for that. Right. We, we can speculate looking at the flow of history, you know, stepping back and kind of looking at big picture because, you know, we, we get a lot of email uh, or, well, I shouldn't say a lot, but we p- frequently get email from people asking, can you put together a chart showing how all the gods, of the different pantheons mm-hmm. fit together? Sort of, because yeah. it's more like a Venn diagram than an actual graph or chart, because right. some of the some names... Some of those are already available online, so you yeah. can find them, and yeah. we'd be happy to post one, but that's not an exact fit. Yeah. You, you go mad trying to fit all the pieces together, because in some cases, you've got one God who claims to fight another God in another pantheon. He is that God. Yeah. Like, what? Yeah, Zeus, exactly. Zeus is fighting himself? What? Exactly. How does that work? Well, and I write it that way in the Red Wing Saga, and I'm sure that there are some people who read it and go, wait a minute, how can she possibly mean mm-hmm. this? Is she... She said this about this one entity, and then this other entity says that he's the god of that or he controls that. Mm-hmm. It's either one entity pretending to be a lot of things, having finger puppets, right. or another entity entirely trying to take territory and saying, no, no, I'm the one who yeah. does that. Yeah, and on top of all that, they lie. They lie all the time. So, they we, lie to one another. But what's interesting is that we see in this line of the kings of Edom that uh, you've got a Hadad in there, mm-hmm. who, which is a reference to the storm god. And in Bad Moon Rising, I, I go into this to some degree, also Last Clash of the Titans, but really more in Bad Moon Rising, where the chief god of the the Edomites, uh, Kos, which is usually mm-hmm. spelled by scholars Q. O O with a circumflex Mm -hmm. and an S. So Kaus, I think, is probably how it's pronounced. Kaus, which is based on the same word that in Hebrew means bow, like in rainbow. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily the bow that an archer would use. Yes, but sometimes those words are interchanged. Yes. so It has to do with the shape of the the arrow in flight, actually. Um, Kaus is not mentioned in the Bible. You see a couple of names that make reference to that as the theophoric element in some of the Edomite uh, leaders, but uh, and uh, some of the characters that show up in the time of David. But other than that, you don't get a mention of that. Like you do Chemosh, the god of Moab, or uh, Milcom, Molech, the god of the Ammonites. It's kind of strange that you don't see that. I mean, you get that for the Philistines with Dagon, and uh, of course the Arameans, their chief god is uh, is the storm god, Baal. Um, Hadad was his name. Baal just means Lord. Mm -hmm. But I think because you see Hadad here and Kaus means bow and then later Lord of the Deshara Mountains, I I think there's a pretty good clue there as to who the Edomites were actually worshiping. Uh, Well, that's the thing. I think sometimes the Lord has put these in here, made sure that we have this list for genealogical Right, reasons. Right. But I think also it's his way of of sneaking in historical connections without actually telling you. Mm-hmm. You can dig into those names and figure out a lot based on the theophoric elements. Right. Now, we don't know where Rehavoth is. Um, 
uh, and Rehoboth on the Euphrates. We, it, you know, I, I've done some reading on this to try to, uh, because again, I was reading that book by Dan Gibson's father on Edom. I'll find it. It's available as a free PDF on the web. So, uh, you know, if you're curious about reading this and, yeah. and, and we find this kind of, or at least I do, I find this kind of stuff really fascinating. I know. I know. So do I. Um, I will put a link to it in the, in the notes, the study notes, so you can dig this out and, and look at it. But I, I had forgotten about that until I saw, oh yeah, this, this little curious reference here, Shaol of the, uh, on the Euphrates. Cause if you look at a map, the Euphrates is pretty far from Edom. And we think of Edom, Moab and Ammon as these little rinky dink, mm-hmm. you know, Kingdom lets. Yeah, it's Rehoboth. Rehoboth. Not, not Shaul. Right. Um, the, these little kingdom lets that, that were just kind of a thorn in Israel's side through the whole time, but really, you know, not much to speak of. But like, wait a minute. If if this guy reigned over Edom and his kingdom, his main city, I mean, there are a couple of ways of, of taking this. His If his city was on the Euphrates and he controlled a really huge territory. Mm-hmm. Of course, the other thing is maybe he just came from that city and came to Edom and, and led a rebellion and took over. We don't it know. It could be, but the name itself actually means wide places or streets. Therefore, this is a large city. Right. And it's also the name of one of the four cities that was built by Nimrod. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's a puzzle. And It is a puzzle. Yeah. And again, Mr. Gibson Sr., his theory to answer this question was that, uh, yes, there was an empire of the Edomites at some point that included northern Egypt and that they were, in fact, the Hyksos, uh, which was the Egyptian term that really means rulers of foreign lands. Right. They didn't call themselves that. No. Hey, we're the Hyksos. We are the Hyksos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Guys in togas walking down the street. Here exactly. we come. Pushing yeah. a little bed. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, enough of a detour there. Shaul died and Baal Hanan, the son of Akbor, reigned in his place. Baal Hanan, the son of Akbor, died and Hadar reigned in his place. The name of his city being Pau, P-A-U. His wife's name was Mehetabel, the daughter of Matred, daughter of Mezahab. By the way, Baal Hanan uh, means Baal is gracious. Uh, so mm. Hanan as in Canaan. I don't know if uh, Canaan is uh, the same word or not, but uh, mm. uh, let me look and see if it is. That would be interesting. Yeah. Because if it means that, it could also mean Lord of Canaan. Um, no, apparently it's not the same word. Oh, okay. All right. So, okay. But, but yeah, Baal and that name being the theophoric element of the mm. name, the God name. Uh, Baal Hanan, the son of Akbor, died. Hadar reigned in his place, the name of his city being Pau. His wife's name was Mehetabel, the daughter of Matred, daughter of Mezahab. Daughter of Matred, son of Utred. <laughs> <laughs> These are the names of the chiefs of Esau, according to their clans and their dwelling places by their names. The chiefs Timna, Alva, Yeheth, Aholabama, Elah, Pinon, Kinaz, Timon, Mibsar, Hmm. Mibsar, I guess, Magdiel and Iram. These are the chiefs of Edom, that is Esau, the father of Edom, according to their dwelling places in the land of their possession. Hmm. Well, there you go. Do we have time to do one more? We do. A miracle, considering how long our blather was. <laughs> we really need to use blather control, mm-hmm. but that ain't never going to happen. Chapter 37. Jacob lived in the land of his father's jo- sojourn, sojournings in the land of of Canaan, Hanan. <laughs> no, not the same word. These are the generations of, yo, I thought I was going to get by without the words. These are the generations of Jacob, Joseph being 17 years old. Oh, I guess we're not going to get a ton of names. Ha ha. Hmm. Joseph being 17 years old was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy. 17 was considered a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Mm-hmm. Joseph ratted them out. They mm-hmm. were probably just not behaving well. Yeah. Now, Israel loved Jacob. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons, because the woman he really loved and wanted to marry was his late wife, mm-hmm. was Joseph's mother. This was his firstborn from the woman he considered his wife. Therefore, We see Joseph presented as, in many cases, the actual owner of the birthright. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason why we actually get it passed to Joseph later on. It leaves um, 
Ribbon is the oldest. Mm -hmm. Right. And he's already, he's already messed up. He's out. Yeah. Yeah. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. This sounds like a big, uh, a, a little deal to us today. Mm-hmm. But bear in mind, dyeing cloth back then wasn't as easy as it is today. You can't just go down and buy a box of writ dye at the, in the corner store and, and, you know, dip your robe into it a few times and get a whole bunch of different colors and uh, sewing them up. Yeah, but uh, interestingly, in Egyptian inscriptions, Egyptian artwork, showing Semitic herders who are coming into the land of Egypt, they are often depicted as wearing robes of many colors. Yes, it was but we not- don't know how long after Joseph or before Joseph. The point is the Lord, through the Holy Spirit, makes a point mm-hmm. that he's been given a garment that signifies that he is the owner of the favor and probably the birthright. Yeah, it is something that set him apart from his brothers. There's no question about it that. It did. And so it, it was be, I think it's a symbol of authority. It's a symbol of love. It's a symbol of money. Yeah, yeah. The, the New English translation, and we like this because the scholars who translated the Net Bible, and it's not Net because it's Internet, New English translation, include in their translator's notes the reasons they chose the terms that they did. Um and they, and rather than a robe of many colors, they said he made a special tunic for him. And the translator's notes reads this. It is not clear what this tunic was like because the meaning of the Hebrew word that describes it is uncertain. It's an archaic Hebrew term, and they haven't found it used enough other places to mm-hmm. get the context for what it really means. The idea that it was a coat of many colors comes from the Greek translation of the Old Testament. So the Septuagint is what leads modern scholars to conclude that it meant many colors. Yes. An examination of cognate terms in Semitic suggests it was either a coat or tunic with long sleeves. I've read that too. Or a tunic that was richly embroidered. I think but that's very likely. But again, the it's, bottom line if it's is, embroidered with colors, yeah. that takes money because those dyes didn't come from a box. They came right. from like grains and sh- and shellfish. Yes. It, Stones yeah. that were sometimes ground up. Yeah. So the, the bottom line is that uh, whether it was many colored or long sleeved or specially embroidered, it was a special coat his brothers didn't have, and it set Joseph apart from the others. Yeah. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now, Joseph had a dream. <laughs> And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. Now, you could extrapolate from this that Joseph not only knew he was favored. Mm-hmm. He sort of liked being favored and yeah. was rubbing it in mm-hmm. to his brothers. Or it could simply be that Joseph was a very honest young man and felt led to share this. Considering his behavior later, either he grew up a lot mm-hmm. or he just always was a very honest young man. <laughs> and besides, daddy owns the company. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> daddy. His brother said to him, Joe, oh my gosh, how funny. You're so funny. Yeah. Joe, where's your coat of many colors, dude? His brother said to him, are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more Mm -hmm, for his mm -hmm. dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and 11 stars were bowing down to me. Mm -hmm. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed? I guess she was still alive at this point. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, because Benjamin hadn't been born. Right, right. Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow down ourselves to the ground before you? 
and his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in well, mind. No, Rachel would already have been deceased. Okay, so then this is probably this, step, yeah, step could, could Yeah, could refer to yeah. Leah or Bilhah, one of his, yeah. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. Good old Shechem, this region. Boy. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm just thinking, too, if if we're looking at this in terms of a divine council concept, sun, moon, 11 stars. Oh, yeah. Chief gods of Mesopotamia, perhaps? Well, at the very least. Uh, Maybe stretching it, it a little I, too far. I think that may be stretching it because clearly he's not part of their pantheon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, and understand, they've been raised to worship El Shaddai. Yeah. Which is how God referred to himself at this point. Yeah, just a thought. Anyway. Yeah. Well, yeah, it does absolutely represent... Uh, the idea that everything in the universe is going to point to Joseph. And and the descendants of Israel, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And what we find out later on is, prophetically speaking, that's exactly what happens. Not just because of Egypt, mm-hmm. but because of the birthright passing to a Gentile. Yeah. Essentially, Joseph represents the Gentile nations mm-hmm. that are later grafted in. Mm-hmm. Because he is actually born of Israel, but he was ruler over Gentile nations, and he has two half-Gentile kids. Yes. Ephraim and Manasseh. And, Manasseh. Right. and now, Ephraim is not named in those lists of the tribes yes. in the book of Revelation. Right. Um, and, and by the way, that is not to say that we are believers, that that uh, we Gentiles are the lost tribes of no, Israel. That is no, not no, no. at all that what we're saying That is such here. a heresy. That truly is. Really? So just want to make that very clear. theology right. yes. is a heresy. Yes, absolutely. So just want to make that very clear. No, it's just really interesting how we are now living in, as we've talked about on, on Unraveling Revelation, we are now living in the times of the Gentiles. Mm-hmm. Because the Gentiles, even to this day, are telling a sovereign nation, Israel, what to do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And Israel said to Joseph, are you not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. Yeah, and as we mentioned before, Shechem was the city that was sacred to the plague god Reshef, Mm -hmm. known later to the Greeks and Romans as Apollo, who was adopted as the personal god, the protector god uh, by Caesar Augustus. Um, Domitian, who was a persecutor of Christians, and also even as late as uh, Constantine the Great, who mm-hmm. uh, legalized Christianity, he was still minting coins and uh, erecting erected a statue to himself at Constantinople, mm-hmm. Istanbul, not Constantinople, <laughs> that uh, depicted him on the top of this pillar as uh, Apollo. So, yeah, Apollo is a very old uh, spirit with a lot of power, La. and Shechem was one of the cities sacred to uh, Reshef slash yeah. Apollo. Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said to him, here I am. That's a wonderful response Mm -hmm. because Joseph knew his brothers hated him. Yeah. They had already hated him, hated him more, hated him even more. And his dad hasn't been terribly happy with him. He has to be thinking, gosh, have I lost favor with dad? Mm-hmm. He's sending me off to my brothers that hate me mm-hmm. out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and the last time I came back with a, 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 a an accurate report, I got in real trouble exactly. with the brothers. He's sending yeah. me out to actually rat on them again to yeah. see if they're really doing what they're supposed to be doing. Hmm, I smell a rat. Come, I will send you to them. And he said to him, here I am, a willing son. So he said to him, go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock and bring me word. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron. And he came to Shechem. That's a long way to walk. I was going to say, that's a long way to walk. Yeah. No wonder Joseph was sending him off to make sure that they were, okay, they've gone off on a on a field trip mm-hmm. with a lot of my, well, frankly, my money. They, he's got, they've got all my flocks. But it also means that he controlled and had access to a huge area. Right. Because Hebron is um, well south and west of Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. Shechem is modern-day Nablus, which is north and east of Jerusalem, and Dothan is north and west of there. Um, I'll, put, I'll put a map showing the wanderings in the, in the study notes so you can see what we're talking about here. Today, driving, it would take you a couple of hours to get from one place to the other. You yeah. walk in, it's going to take you days. Yeah, and driving, you're in a nice air-conditioned vehicle. Yep. So he sent him from the Valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And a man found him wandering in the fields, and the man asked him, What are you seeking? I'm seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where they are pasturing the flock. And the man said, 
they've gone away, for I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. <laughs> and, and think about this, too. This just occurred to me. Wait a minute. Wasn't it your brothers who slaughtered all the men of this city? Yeah, wait a, a minute. Just a few years ago? We've still got memories of that. Yeah. Hey. That was kind of risky. Yeah. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from afar, wearing his little coat, mm -hmm. and before he came near, before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. They said to one another, here comes the dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we, it says pits here, what's it actually mean? Cisterns, so big holes. You know, Dothan was another um, form of the name Didan, which is the origin of the Greek word Titan. I know, but I thought hmm. Dothan actually meant two wells. Not according to the dictionary deities and oh, demons. It's another form oh. of Dathan. 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 Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Where is your Are messiah they? now? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him and we will see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he rescued him out of the, his, their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand to restore him to his father. Now, it could be Reuben was concerned. Let's not do this evil thing. Uh, let's just do something that makes sort of satisfied our satisfies his brother's bloodlust, mm -hmm. allows Reuben to be the hero. Right. Yeah. Dad, yeah. guess what happened? I saved your favorite. Yeah. Can I, can I have my inheritance <laughs> Exactly. Can yeah. I have a nice coat? Yeah. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. So it'd be a cistern, like a well. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Then they sat down to eat, had a picnic, mm -hmm. and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead, with their camels bearing gum, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judas said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. Then Midianite traders passed by, and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. 20 pieces of silver. Not 30. No, not 30. But according to the law of Hammurabi in the 18th century BC, 17th, basically time of Abraham, mm -hmm. that was the average price of a slave. Oh, that's interesting. So historically accurate. There you go. They took him. To Egypt. Mm -hmm. Now, when Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, he tore his clothes and returned to his brothers and said, the boy is gone. And I, where shall I go? Mm -hmm. Then they took Joseph's robe and slaughtered a goat and dipped the robe in the blood. And they sent the robe of many colors and brought it to their father and said, this we have found. Please identify whether it is your son's robe or not. How cruel is that? Yeah. Yeah, that's horrible. And he identified it and said, it is my son's robe. A fierce animal has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn to pieces. Then jo Jacob tore his garments and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned his father for many days, hmm. his son for many days. Now all his sons and all his daughters, plural, Mm -hmm. Not just Dinah. Yeah. All his daughters rose up to comfort him, and he refused to be comforted and said, No, I shall go down to Sheol to my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. So this is an indication of the understanding that they had of the afterlife, that mm -hmm. Sheol was in the earth, that it was below. That's where the spirit's afterlife mm -hmm. resided. Mm -hmm. And he believed that that's where he was going to go after death. He would go down to Sheol, the underworld. Again, still didn't have the understanding of re redemption, of, mm -hmm. of being lifted out of that life someday. Right. Even though we, we saw that in Job. 
Well, and this was a belief not only that there was an underworld, but there were layers to the underworld. Yes. And when you got down there, it was it was vague as to exactly what was going to happen to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Meanwhile, the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. And next week we will pick we up will. with... Oh, yes. Yes. The, the plot, adventures of... The plot thickens. Um and actually, there'll be another interlude as we'll we'll see the origin story of the tribe of Judah. Backstory. Yeah. So some interesting and, inter- and that will give us a little more insight into the, the pagan realm and the worship of the goddess Inanna, yes. Ishtar, Astarte. Oh, yeah. And um, I think also more evidence that the Bible is true because they could have cleaned if the Bible had been mm-hmm. edited to clean things up and make the, the, the patriarchs look righteous and holy. Mm-hmm. Uh, chapter 38 of Genesis was, would probably have been cut out. And that's where we'll pick up next. Week. Well, also, I think the details of chapter 37 would sure. have been massaged in a different way. OK, instead of saying they tried to kill their brother and then uh, somebody else came along, found him and sin sold him. We will just say that he was. Lost on the way yeah. to finding his brothers, right. and they just assumed he was dead. Mm-hmm. But no, that stuff was left in there. They mm-hmm. tried. They they were they were murderous. They had murderous intent. Yeah. But then they tried to you know okay let's let's not kill him ourselves and put the blood on our hands. Let's just throw him in this pit. And they, oh wait, let's just sell him this. Tell you what, let's make twenty pieces of silver while we're at this. But they ended up not making any money at all because the Midianites sold him. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, it, it they, they don't come off looking well, Joseph's no, they brothers don't. here. But again, the Lord knows all the plans of the enemy. They don't know all his plans. He knows all theirs. Yeah. He's got the advantage. Advantage, Lord. <laughs> and the, the fact that he uses imperfect humans to achieve his, his ends uh, is remarkable because when, when we look at these the, the stories of, of the, the, the patriarchs and, and see Abraham was afraid. He tried to take, he, he didn't have complete faith. He tried to take matters into his own hands. It's like, oh, okay, well, Sarah's still barren. So, uh, uh, yeah, okay. All right. Well, I better take the handmaid. Yeah. So we'll okay. take the handmaid. We'll do that. And that, that, that's how, that's probably what God meant. You know, we, we need to go ahead and fulfill the, the, the promise ourselves. Boy, men do that today. Oh, we sure do. Oh, gosh. I, I mean, mean, that's the whole premise. Entire of the, organizations do that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and the premise of the, the entire premise of the transhumanist movement, the Christian transhumanist mm-hmm. anyway, is, is based on that. Yeah. God gave us this technology so that we could become as. No, that's not what he meant. It's the premise of dominionism. <laughs> it's the pre- premise of dominionism. We need to take over the world so Jesus can return. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, that's no, not what that. Believe it or not, he can do that on his own. That's not how any of this works. <laughs> So, yeah, there, there's a lot of that in, in Scripture. We see the flawed humans and God working through them, which means. Praise God, we have a Savior. Uh, amen to that. And uh, it, it, that takes us right into. It is by grace we are saved through faith and not by works so that no one can boast. Amen. And yes, and that leads us to our um, monthly commemoration of that night in which Jesus was betrayed. And we celebrate uh Communion, which, uh, again, is not a ritual that that imparts any special um, spiritual impartation on us. Does it? I know there are denominations who believe in the transubstantiation of the elements that they somehow turn into the, literally turn into the body and blood of you. No, there's none of that. These are symbols. Yeah. And uh, this is just a a commemorative, and especially in the context of what we found researching the book Veneration, that this is a reversal of these ritual meals that the pagans practiced, believing that they had to have this ritual meal to feed their dead ancestors. We are having this meal as a commemoration, proclaiming Christ's death, but only until he returns. Mm -hmm. So uh, Paul wrote this out to the church at Corinth, and it's, it's in first Corinthians chapter 11, beginning at verse 23. For I received from the Lord, what I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. 
Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Amen to that. So who is on VFTB tonight? Tonight, Mark Sutherland. Oh, my goodness. We love Mark Sutherland. He will report to you the things that are going on from a Brit's viewpoint. Mm -hmm. And he's very insightful. Filmmaker. He's got a uh, short film to which he which he served as producer called the um, the Iris Echo, which is really insightful. And I'll put a link to that, uh, the Vimeo uh, link for that in the notes as well. So that you can uh, at VFTB tonight, you know, you, when you, you hear the program, you'll you'll want to watch that film because it's really insightful and kind of speaks to where we are and how our perceptions are manipulated by media. So, um, yeah, Mark, really, really a good man. And we look forward to travel restrictions being lifted so he can get back over to this side of the pond. Yeah. We, we saw him. Pretty much the last weekend we were allowed to travel back the first weekend in March. I'm so glad that they decided to go ahead and do that conference in person because it was the last opportunity, as we discovered later. Yeah. Um, now, tomorrow morning, Monday morning, the 8th mm-hmm. of June, uh, we will have the Unraveling Revelation Part 2 mm-hmm. of your interview with David W. Lowe. Yeah. We'll talk about the seals, the opening of the seals in Revelation 6 and the timing thereof. Uh, David's book, Earthquake Resurrection, and uh, his follow-up book to that, Then His Voice Shook mm-hmm. the Earth, very influential in helping us kind of settle in our minds where we think, how we think the timeline of Revelation is playing out. Exactly. And by the way, in case you have watched any of those or heard us talking about the timeline of, of those, it's it's different than you've probably been taught. Mm-hmm. Um, we are not dogmatic about that. Mm. We really are not. We want, we encourage everyone to study prophecy, to study scripture and allow the Holy Spirit to, to teach you. Mm -hmm. Um, We bring in people with different viewpoints and we, it's, it's the way it used to be on a certain network news station. Mm -hmm. We report, you decide. Yeah. Um, we really do want you to decide. There are just a few things that Derek and I, a few doctrinal issues that we will not budge from. Right. We are dogmatic about those. Mm-hmm. And that has to do with the virgin birth, the fact that the Lord died a perfect sacrifice, that he is God incarnate, mm-hmm. that God is one, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We are Trinity believers. Mm-hmm. We believe he is coming again. We believe he resurrected. Literally rose from the dead. Bodily Mm -hmm. resurrected. Uh, So those basic tenets we will not budge from. But when it comes to prophecy, because the Lord is the best general ever, he doesn't reveal all of his plans to the fallen realm. Right. So there are things we will not know until they're they're revealed to us Mm -hmm. in that day. So, um but yeah, uh, so we're, we're willing to consider other points of view. Mm-hmm. But and, we find him very persuasive. I, I, yes. I like his uh, supportive arguments. It yeah. makes sense to me. And very scriptural. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Father, we thank you for bringing us together over your word. And um, just a reminder, Father, that um, you work through imperfect humans to achieve your ends. The only perfect human who walked among us was you. Mm-hmm. And we are grateful that you did because your sacrifice in going to the cross willingly and taking up your life again is what has redeemed us, redeemed us from the clutches of the enemy. Father, we pray again for wisdom, discernment, and love that we would be open to hearing the grievances of those who have been wronged and being willing to work towards a b- building bridges with those who want to close the, the, the gap that the enemies have, have driven between us. Father, we know there are those who will not listen, who are in the grip of the enemy. But we pray, Father, that uh, you give us the wisdom and the courage to speak the truth And to any who will not listen, to do as you commanded the disciples, to just shake the dust from our sandals and move on. Lord, we know that our ultimate victory 
We will not attain the ultimate victory. You will do that when you return. Until then, our mission is to is to work to help the wounded, the spiritually wounded who are lying on the field of battle, many of whom may not even realize their condition, the condition that they're in. So, Lord, again, we just ask for the words to speak, the wisdom and the discernment, knowing when and what and where and how to shine the light of your love into the dark corners of this existence. And we pray for your soon return, Father, in a day when all wrongs will be made right. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Until next time, I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We post a new Bible study each Sunday morning. Subscribe to the podcast and explore the archives online at gilberthouse.org. 